Hi everybody, we're going to discuss head and neck squamous cell carcinoma here. This is really, really common. It's becoming more common in the United States. Um, and this is also something that uh, is relatively common outside of the United States as well. So uh, this is 90% of malignant neck masses, and uh, I'm excluding uh, things that can present as neck masses, such as lymphomas, thyroid cancer, uh, etc. Uh, those are addressed elsewhere. This is really the bread and butter uh, neck mass because this is arising from structures in the neck that aren't organs for other purposes. So we're talking the nose, the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx. So here's our uh, head and neck cancer regions. These are the regions of concern when we think about head and neck cancer. So uh, there's, of course, the oral cavity in the tongue and the, uh, the buccal mucosa, um, the uh, hard and soft palate, your nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, uh, and then the pharynx, which is uh, is consistent with the nasal cavity and oral cavity. So you have a nasopharynx, an oropharynx, and then below that, a hypopharynx, which runs parallel to your larynx. And the larynx, of course, goes down into the respiratory tract, whereas the hypopharynx ultimately goes down into the esophagus. 90% of head and neck cancers are squamous cell carcinomas, and these make up 5% of all malignancies in the United States. Uh, this is also uh, the most common uh, head and neck cancer uh, worldwide. Uh, there's a male predominance, about 3 to 4 to 1, so this is about four times more common in men than in women. As mentioned, the location anywhere in the oral cavity, including the hard and soft palate, the uh, lips, the tongue, uh, the pharynx, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx, the larynx, uh, including the vocal cords, the paranasal sinuses, the nasal cavity, and the salivary glands. The risk factors for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma are far and away tobacco and alcohol use. 85% of patients that are diagnosed with head and neck cancer have or currently use tobacco. Uh, so that's really uh, an important factor to keep in mind. So it's tobacco use and alcohol. And if you think about it, it's similar to esophageal cancer, squamous cell esophageal cancer, tobacco and alcohol use are both risk factors for that as well. Uh, so another thing in, to, important to keep in mind is an immunologic uh, aspect. Patients who are infected with HIV have an increased risk of developing head and neck squamous cell carcinoma as well as patients who are or have been infected with the Epstein-Barr virus they're at increased risk, particularly of developing cancer of the nasopharynx. And remember what the Epstein-Barr virus is. Most commonly, it's associated with mononucleosis, but it's also associated with uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. Occupational exposures include uh, nickel and sawdust. Ionizing radiation also include uh, also increase the risk of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, particularly of the salivary gland. Some other risk factors include uh, HPV exposure. About 10% of people carry the HPV virus in their uh, oral pharynx. Chinese ancestry, formaldehyde exposure, salted food, beetle use. People don't commonly use this in the U.S., but a beetle, uh, the beetle is a, uh, it's like a leaf that's commonly consumed in, uh, or used like a tobacco or a recreational, a legal recreational drug in South and Southeast Asia. And uh, like I said, we don't really use this in the U.S., but it's commonly consumed recreationally uh, in Southeast Asia. So it's something to keep in mind if you're dealing with an immigrant patient. And then mate consumption, this is a drink in, uh, commonly consumed in South America. The symptoms of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma depend on the location of the tumor. Uh, the chronic history of a non-healing ulcer is very common, especially if you're dealing with something in the uh, oral cavity. Uh, 
or in the uh, in the nasal cavity. A neck mass may be present, especially if this is a pharyngeal or a laryngeal tumor. Epistaxis, of course, that's going to be if it's a nasal tumor. Hemoptysis, dyspnea, hoarseness, and dysphagia. So again, you're gonna all of these uh, symptoms. They really depend on where it's at. You're not gonna have dysphagia or hoarseness if you've got a tumor on your lip. Uh, and likewise, you're not going to have epistaxis if you have a tumor in your larynx. But if you have a tumor in your nose, then epistaxis uh, is certainly a possibility. So uh, it really depends on the location. And also a factor that you need to keep in mind is that this is a chronic history. So this isn't an acute neck mass or an acute dysphagia. This is something that's been going on for some time, and it's gotten worse. So if you break it down by type, uh, you can, uh, it broke down the symptoms, number one symptom by the type of uh, tumor. So in the oral cavity, the number one symptom is actually pain. In the pharynx, if it's in the nasopharynx, the number one, uh, number one symptom are neck mass, uh, just especially if it's you know if it's back further, you can either a perceived neck mass or a palpable neck mass. And interestingly, serous otitis media. And the reason for that is because it blocks the eustachian tube uh, and where it empties out into the pharynx. The oro and hypopharynx, of course, because they're both down closer to where the esophagus starts, it can cause dysphagia. That's the number one symptom. With the larynx, understandably, it causes hoarseness. And then the paranasal sinus, nasal cavity, and salivary glands are all uh, appreciated or perceived as a mass. You just need to uh, put it together with the symptoms, though. And when you do your physical exam, you're going to be looking in all of these places. It's also important to remember that many patients with uh, cancer, but particularly head and neck cancer, are already malnourished either because of the tumor obstruction or due to alcoholism. Remember that a lot of these patients are already uh, alcoholics. So for physical examination, uh, and you may not do all of these things. Uh, some of these things may be done by you in the office. Some of these things may be done by a head and neck specialist. So certainly an intranasal examination, uh, you can use an indirect mirror to visualize the nasal cavity. A careful oral examination, certainly we can all do this, to visualize the oral cavity, oropharynx, the lips, the base of the tongue, uh, as well as the uh, uh, sort of uh, more posterior structures like the tonsils and the uvula. A fiber optic examination is usually done by a head and neck specialist, and this can visualize deeper into the nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx, and the larynx. And then examination of cervical lymph nodes, that's going to be one of the first places that this spreads. And that's important uh, to know if there's any cervical spread because you'll want to get uh, a biopsy of that node. That's going to play an important role when it comes to staging and treatment. So I, didn't, I wasn't able to find the exact numbers, but I would say that when it comes to head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, uh, tumors of the oral cavity are probably the most uh, more common or the most common. Um, don't quote me on that, but I would say that it's m way more common in the oral cavity. That's one of the most common places to see it. So here you see it on the tongue. Here you see it on the uh, buccal mucosa. And of course you're going to want to biopsy all of this. And then here you see uh, what winds up being a squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx. So it's on the laryngeal folds here. And like I said, you're going to biopsy all of these. You can't make a diagnosis of a cancer without, an official diagnosis of cancer without a biopsy. So for diagnosis, the initial diagnostic step after you've completed your physical examination and you're still considering head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is a triple endoscopy. That includes a laryngoscopy, a bronchoscopy, and an upper endoscopy. So with the laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy, you're looking at your larynx, you're looking at uh, deeper down into the, uh, into the bronchi where you can get squamous cell carcinomas down there too. The upper endoscopy 
you're uh, going into the uh, down the esophagus and looking at the pharynx as well. And this can it should be followed with biopsy if there's any suspicious lesions that are found. So once you get the biopsy, if the diagnosis is head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, then you'll continue your workup, and that's going to be to stage the tumor. Uh, so first off, you're going to want to do a CT uh, with or without a PET exam, and that is going to be to look for any distant metastases, as well as to look for uh, looking at the uh, actual, and you may use MRI for this too, uh, but you can do CT, uh, to look at the depth of the invasion or if there's any surrounding structures that are invaded, uh, your histology can help you with that too. Uh, fine needle aspiration is going to be done if there's any affected node or suspicious node. And then, as mentioned, the biopsy is done, but you're also going to want to note and recognize if the squamous cell carcinoma is positive for human papillomavirus. And this is typical of the oro and pharyngeal tumors. And it's actually increasing in the United States. Uh, overall, oro and pharyngeal tumors are decreasing, but the uh, oral and pharyngeal tumors that are HPV positive are increasing. So very important to, to determine whether the squamous cell carcinoma is positive for HPV. And actually, if it is positive for HPV, that confers a better prognosis than if it's negative for HPV. The cancer at that point then can be appropriately staged, which then will provide your guideline for treatment. Although the staging is technically different based on the location of the tumor, it's different if it's in the nasopharynx, and if it's in the oropharynx, and if it's in the nasal cavity, then if it's in the larynx. And so technically the staging is different, but overall the theme is that the stage is based on the size of the tumor, the significance, the depth of invasion, uh, whether it involves other structures in the surrounding area, the presence of lymphatic metastases, and of course the presence of distant metastases, the Actual criteria, though, differ based on location. You don't need to memorize it for the USMLE. Uh, any distant metastasis, though, you should remember, confers a diagnosis of stage 4. That's advanced. In general, the treatment, if it's stage 1, uh, is going to be radiation or surgical excision. A lot of the stage 1 tumors are very small. They can be amenable to radiation, and that can actually get rid of the tumor. However, you might go with surgical excision depending on where the tumor is at. Stage 2, you may need to do both radiation and or surgical excision. So stage 1 and 2 are, are, are pretty similar. You can do radiation or surgical excision, but with stage 2, you might do both. Stage 3 and 4, we're going to for sure do radiation and surgical excision, uh, and then we're going to add on chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is platinum-based. Uh, so we use cisplatin, and then we use Taxol, or uh, its generic name is Paclitaxel. So that's our chemotherapy. Also important to remember that we use cetuximab. And cetuximab is a newer drug, a monoclonal antibody, and it is an epidermal growth factor inhibitor, and it's shown to improve uh, outcomes with head and neck cancer. Overall, however, head and neck cancer confers a relatively poor prognosis, unfortunately. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, let me know.